persuasive technologies have their roots in communication in my discipline for a long time. There was a big, uh, a, fam a now famous effort in, in Stanford University uh, in the Bay Area in the, in the 1990s, the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. And if you go now to their websites, to their historical websites, you can see how often the word ethical is nowadays written on this website because, uh, you know, these technologies have been a little bit abused in order to, to control people, to brainwash people. Now, uh, the person who, the professor who ran this lab, B.J. Fogg, he's a really likable, nice guy, and he studies behavioral change. Most of his reason, or most of his books all the way along is to show you and to teach to people how they can create useful habits of how they can actually become better people uh, in order to create new habits. He wrote about persuasive technology as a powerful tool in order to change your habits. And that has a long, long tradition in the literature. Uh, it's, it's referred, economists refer to this literature as nudging. You know, you can nudge somebody with your elbow, you try to give them, you just try to give them a little nudge to, to, to do something. So behavioral economists have been working on that to nudge people to, to develop better habits. For example, to become organ donors or to stop smoking or to so how do you do this in order to motivate people to become to do something that's useful to society even if it's something like a little bit like organ donation right so can you nudge or, or stop smoking which is then also good for everybody and good for the health care cost uh, or how can you help have them nudge them to you know order some healthy foods or do their health checkups get their vaccination and these these theories became very popular in 2017, the Richard Thaler the, got the Nobel Prize in economics. So these are extremely useful, useful economic, it's extremely successful economic theories of nudging. And most of them have been used to get the best out of people, to not spend so much, to save a little bit their money, for example, to not put so much on the credit card, to stop social media. Wait, no, wait, to what? Well, of course. You can use that for both ways, but these, then this nudging and this persuading can also be used in order to get people use more social media and control them more. And if that's your business model, right, that's what you will basically use, persuasive technology to fostering your business model. This kind of literature of behavioral economics is based on the psychological tradition of judgment under uncertainty. And Kahneman and Tversky have been leading in that Kahneman and also getting later on the Nobel Prize for his contribution to these fields. And they say research on judgment under uncertainty typically comes down to a collection of heuristics and biases. So what is that? Well, evolutionary wise, we develop our mind and that's important to understand our mind a little bit because these technologies, that's where they dog on, the extensions of our minds. Uh, our minds have evolved uh, some kind of computing machines you might think of that have some shortcuts. So evolution taught us some shortcuts that we, that we live with uh, that are extremely useful. And cognitive psychologists have detected some 200 of them. So if you go to the Wikipedia page of list of cognitive biases, you will find 200 heuristics and biases, kind of like shortcuts that we would that we would use to make decisions under uncertainty. And these kind of characteristics of how our mind works is what these persuasive technology basically figured out through their blind A-B testing. And that's what they take advantage of in order to then get us to do what they want us to do. First of all, to get our attention and then to change our behavior. For example, click on the next thing or something like that, right? To nudge us. For example, I show you two cognitive biases now and how they relate to fake news. Again, it's not like somebody sitting in the basement trying to think like, how can we make the world full of fake news and, and misinformation? No, it's just basic technologies try to understand how they can hold our attention. For example, with the confirmation bias, a very proven bias, a very long-standing bias. Now, if, you sh if I show you something, if I tell you something that is in agreement with your previously existing opinion, you are 88% less likely to identify it as fake just because you previously believed it. And you will, you will also like that more, right? It's like, no, that's true. I knew that before. I want to be, no, I knew that before. I so also 69% you have a, a robust uh, memory 
of what I told you, if it, it's in agreement with what you previously believed, even if I later on tell you, you know what, <laughs> just kidding, that's not really true. That was just... But then three months later, you will remember what you wanted to remember, which was an agreement with your previously existing, it confirmed, it's a confirmation, it confirmed what you previously already knew. So, uh, and you have, you like to see what you, so that's, that's how we create these filter bubbles and these echo chambers. Uh, and you also would like that. You, you like to be confirmed. You like to be right. Second, the novelty bias. Another bias, uh, which has been very long standing. We are all descendants of those ancestors who disproportionately paid a pen, attention to new things, something novel. Those who didn't, were eaten by the sable-toothed tiger. <laughs> right? So it was extremely useful to kind of like see around what's what's still going on, what's new, what's going on, right? And, and we inherited that. We have part of that. It's like a little bird that's picking picking something and then looking around what's new. So we are genetically programmed to do that. That's part of our part of our brain. So if I show you something new, something novel, you are likely to pay more attention to it. And that's the currency in the attention economy. Because once I have your attention, I can study you better. I understand what you want. I have your attention. I can change your behavior. And that's the product that's being sold. Now, so if I show you something that's not novel, for example, I tell you, well, there's a virus. It's a deadly virus. Wash your hands. Well, how, how boring is that? You know that. You know, you, you heard that. That's not. But if I tell you, well, take some Clorox, put it down your throat, and you're like, what? That's something completely novel. So you're programmed to pay attention to something like that. And fake news are more likely to be novel. As a result, fake news spread six times faster, 20 times deeper, and twice as broad as real news uh, because they're not as novel, mainly. That's what this study shows you, right? So the combination of the confirmation bias showing you what you actually want to see, what re reconfirm that tells you you are right, combined with something novel, Right, then really has your attention. So I look what you're actually interested in, and down that line I show you something a little bit novel. It surely has your attention. Now, it's not the task of the attention economy companies to show you the truth and to educate you. Absolutely not. That's not of their business model. Their business model is to have your attention, and once they have your attention, get your attention to change your behavior because that's the product they are selling. The client is the person that wants the behavior change, and their platform is uh, what's providing the delivery of this product. And that's what persuasive technology in the attention economy is basically about.